we help children who become easily overwhelmed in the classroom? That's what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Pookie Ponders. Let's dive straight in. Let's start with a story that many of you might find familiar. Imagine a child, we'll call her Emma. So Emma is bright and curious and eager to learn. But for Emma, the classroom can sometimes feel like a storm of sensory inputs and expectations. One day, during a particularly noisy group activity, Emma's excitement quickly turns to distress. The chatter of her classmates, the flickering of the overhead lights, the shuffle of the papers, it all becomes just too much. Emma covers her ears, her eyes well up and she retreats to a corner of the room. Her teacher, recognising the signs, gently approaches her, offers her some quiet support that she needs to find her calm again. This moment for Emma illustrates what it feels like to be overwhelmed. It's not about lacking the desire to participate or the ability to engage with the lesson. It's about experiencing an overload of sensory inputs, emotional responses or cognitive demands that surpass the ability to cope. For children like Emma, these moments of overwhelm can be triggered by a variety of factors, loud noises, bright lights, unexpected changes or the pressure of social interactions. Being overwhelmed can manifest in many different ways. Some children might withdraw like Emma did, while others might act out. They might become agitated or they might even shut down completely. The signs are there, though they may vary from child to child. Difficulty focusing, irritability, physical symptoms like headaches or stomach aches, or an intense emotional reaction that seems out of proportion to the situation, though I would have to say, having been there frequently, I can promise you that it feels completely in proportion at the time. Feeling overwhelmed is horrible. Understanding these signs and the triggers is the first step to supporting our children. It's going to help us to somewhat empathise with their experience and it's going to guide us in creating environments and strategies that can mitigate in these moments of overwhelm. So let's try and understand the roots and dive a little bit deeper into the causes of children feeling overwhelmed in the classroom. Understanding the underlying issues is going to be crucial in crafting effective strategies to support our children. So we're going to focus today on two key contributors, the sensory sensitivities and the emotional dysregulation. They're not the only factors, but they're the two we're going to think about today. So let's think first about sensory sensitivities, our senses, sight, sound, touch, taste and smell there are windows to the world for some children these windows are a bit more open than for others letting in a flood of information that can be somewhat difficult to process so just imagine walking into a room where every light is glaringly bright every sound is magnified and every texture is intensified for children with sensory sensitivities this is what their everyday experience feels like not just in specific environments but all the time in every classroom where they're meant to learn and grow. It makes life really tricky. And again, I talk about children. This is my experience all day, every day too. It's the experience of many autistic adults as well. The difference is I don't have to learn in your classroom. I can create an environment around me that is providing the appropriate amount of sensory input for me. But if I had to come and learn in your classroom, I would be probably just as overwhelmed as the child that has brought you to listen to this episode today. Sensory overload can quickly lead to feelings of being overwhelmed. Like a, a tag in a t-shirt isn't just annoying, it's unbearable. The hum of the fluorescent lights isn't just like a little background noise. It's not a distraction that, that can be ignored. These sensitivities and recognising them is the first step in creating a more accommodating space, environment, culture. Simple adjustments like reducing the noise levels, dimming the lights a little bit or providing sensory breaks can make a significant difference for our children. Then what about emotional dysregulation? Emotional regulation is our ability to manage and respond to our emotions in a way that's socially acceptable and it allows us to achieve our goals in a given day or situation. For many children, especially those with special needs, this skill doesn't come especially easily. 
And again, I say children, same for us adults too sometimes. Um, these children, adults, people, may experience emotions more intensely. They might have more difficulty in identifying their feelings. They might lack the strategies to express themselves in constructive, socially acceptable ways. When emotions run high and coping strategies run low, our children can quickly become overwhelmed. It's like having a cup that's too small to hold all your feelings in. Eventually, it's going to overflow. That can get messy. So teaching emotional regulation skills is akin to giving the child a bigger cup, basically. So techniques like deep breathing, using words or symbols to express and uh, communicate our feelings, engaging in calming activities. These are all things that can empower our children to manage those emotions more effectively day to day, minute to minute. Understanding a little bit about the sensory sensitivities and the emotional dysregulation that our children might be facing, we can then explore some practical strategies tailored to meet these challenges kind of head on. So I'm going to share with you 10 uh, strategies today, which are designed to be straightforward. They're designed to require minimal preparation, which we like, um, and minimal resources so that you can integrate them really easily into your busy classroom routine, or you may be able to use some of them at home as well if you're listening from home. They are pretty proactive and reactive um, so you can use them for different scenarios um, and they're designed to prevent overwhelm and respond effectively when it occurs so let's jump in because I can waffle on as much as I like about how great they are but let's just hear them so number one is quiet zones so designating a quiet corner or area in the classroom where your children can go to calm down or take a little bit of a sensory break so equipping it with things like soft furnishings calming visuals headphones for noise reduction can make a really big difference here. Number two, visual schedules. We love these. So using visual schedules, visual timetables to provide a predictable structure for the day. So the child knows what is happening now, what is happening next. This can reduce anxiety about the unknown. This hugely, hugely helps. This can be as simple as a series of pictures or icons that show the day's activities. Number three is sensory bins. So creating kind of bins, boxes, containers filled with materials like rice, beans, water, stuff that feels interesting for tactile exploration. These can really help children who need sensory input in order to regulate their emotions. So our sensory seeking children, many of our ADHD kids really need this input and these sensory bins can feel great for them. Number four is emotion regulation charts. So emotional regulation charts, if we implement charts or boards that are going to help children to identify their emotions and choose appropriate coping strategies. So for example, having something like a feelings wheel um, that might have a corresponding kind of list of calm down activities. So we can identify how we're feeling, but then we can also identify appropriate responses to that in order to help us to manage and respond to how we're feeling. One little caveat on that is when we're looking at this, it's really important that our children understand that all our feelings are valid and they're all okay. It's okay to feel all these different things and we need to learn to embrace that, to recognize that. But we also need to learn that there are things we can do about it. So if like we don't like how we feel right now, then there are things we can do to change how we're feeling. If we're feeling anxious or angry or overwhelmed or distressed and we don't want to feel like that, then there are things that we can do to reduce that overwhelm and learning that, learning that there are things we can do to help to emotionally regulate and to regulate our physiological responses is like gaining a superpower. So learning that link, learning to recognize those signs, building the skills in order to respond appropriately is a real gift for a child. Number five is mindfulness moments. Love a little bit of mindful moments. So introducing just short moments of mindfulness, like little breathing exercises or calming techniques. These can be particularly helpful, things like the beginning of the day or before transitions, just to get us to re-regulate a point before we enter into the next hard thing. It can be as simple as just taking three deep breaths together as a class. Just these little moments of regulation. Co-regulation altogether can feel especially calming. Number six is flexible seating options, offering a variety of seating options. I've done whole podcasts on the importance of where children sit, but yeah, a whole variety of seating options about where they sit and what they sit on. So having options like bean bags, wobble chairs, standing desks, if we can, to accommodate different sensory needs and preferences can make a big difference. Where a child sits and what they sit on is something we very rarely think about that makes a huge amount of difference to a child's capacity to cope 
and thrive in your classroom. If you haven't thought about it before, I invite you to think about it and to wonder, could this make a difference to anybody in my class? Number eight is personalized break cards, giving children personalized break cards that they can use when they're beginning to feel overwhelmed. This only really works if the child has learned to begin to recognize those early warning signs of overwhelm. So we're gonna do a bit of exploration with them. What does that feel like in my body, in my head? What are the signs that suggest that I'm not quite feeling at my very best right now? And when's the appropriate time for me to take that break? These breaks are much more effective if we can take them ahead of the big overwhelm rather than in response to it. So trying to be proactive with those breaks if we can. Um, enabling that child with these cards or similar other, other signs um, to take a step away, take a regulatory moment, a little moment of reset before things get completely out of hand. And a card or another kind of visual symbol um, is going to enable the child to let us know that they need to take that time out without them needing to verbalise it. And of course for some of our children, verbalisation of of their needs can become impossible as overwhelm begins to kick in. And again, I refer to children because children are my area of expertise, but I also find this personally impossible. The points at which I most need help are the points at which I'm least able to ask for it. And I rely on those who know me well to interpret my complete muteness and utter struggle to communicate into something helpful that can be utilised to help me. Though fortunately, as an adult, one generally has the right to get up and leave should one wish to. Not always possible in the classroom, so we need to create appropriate escape mechanisms for children who may need them. Number nine is emotion-based activities. So incorporating activities that allow children to express their emotions. So drawing, writing, storytelling, these things can help children to process and begin to communicate their feelings in a safe way. This is all about building that emotional literacy, working through the challenging things that we might be feeling rather than these things just building up and building up and building up until we become totally overwhelmed. And number 10 is about teacher or other trusted adult check-ins. So scheduling regular one-to-one -one check ins with the student to discuss their feelings and their challenges. This is going to foster a trusting relationship and provide individual support as and when needed for the child. So each of these strategies is going to offer a way to make your classroom, your space, your setting a more supporting and understanding space for your children who sometimes experience overwhelm. Remember, the goal isn't to eliminate the challenges. We can't really do that very easily, but rather to equip children with the tools that they need to be able to navigate these challenges as they arise successfully. These are skills not just for use in school and in your classroom, but actually skills that they will use in their lives as well. Creating a sensory friendly and emotionally supportive classroom doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be time consuming though. Um, and small changes that you make can make a big difference and actually reduce the need to return to these strategies. Um, so let's think about how we can implement some strategies to actually make a more inclusive, more understanding learning environment. So perhaps we don't reach the point of overwhelm quite so often. Okay, so we're gonna think now about how teachers and other adults and classmates also can play like a really crucial role in the process of creating a supportive classroom environment for all of our children. Um, so it's gonna start with a culture of empathy and a culture of respect. It's gonna be about recognizing that each child, including those who become more easily overwhelmed, bring a unique set of strengths and challenges to the classroom. So there are some ways that we can foster this positive environment, this positive culture. So first of all, we can educate about differences. We can begin by educating all of our students about diversity, including neurodiversity and sensory sensitivities, using age appropriate discussions and activities to promote understanding and empathy amongst classmates. What we find is when we do some work on peer education, that peers become the most amazing support for their friends. Generally, kids actually really want to help each other. When they don't understand, there can be some fear there, there can be some feeling of a lack of uh, sort of equity and fairness can be a problem and so on and so forth. But once we start to help children understand the world from each other's point of view and the things that they can do to support their friends, often they're absolutely brilliant. A little bit of time here goes a very long way. 
We can then think about promoting inclusivity, so encouraging activities that are going to proactively promote inclusivity and teamwork, ensuring that every single child is going to feel valued and included as part of your class team. This might be group projects that cater to a range of different abilities or classroom roles that allow each child to really contribute in a meaningful way that feels acceptable uh, and appropriate and fun to them. We can model acceptance. So as teachers, as adults, as leaders of our children, we're going to set the tone. So by demonstrating acceptance and understanding, then we are going to inspire our students to do the same. Another thing that we might want to model and just generally think about is our communication. So this is another thing that's going to make a really big difference to the culture in our classroom, the ability for some of our children to cope and thrive. So what can we do here? What can we emulate for our students? What can we hope to achieve each day? So first of all, calm, reassuring language. When a child is overwhelmed, a calm and reassuring tone is going to help to soothe that anxiety. Think about an audible hug. Simple, clear language um, that expresses understanding and support is what that child needs to hear. Next, think about your non-verbal cues. So communication isn't just verbal. She says talking to you on a podcast where all you can do is hear me, maybe see me if you're on the video, hello. Um, but communication isn't just verbal. Maintaining open body language, actually thinking about how your body is positioned, gentle smiles, and maybe the use of some sort of visual aid sometimes can help to convey the messages that we want to. These non-verbal cues can be especially comforting when children are feeling overwhelmed. Um, we might want to make them more obvious than we otherwise might um, at points at which a child is overwhelmed because their ability to kind of interpret and manage the world around them is going to be somewhat diminished. So we might want to exaggerate that body language, make that smile a little bit bigger um, and maybe lean into the visual cues a little bit more as well. We're going to listen actively. So showing that we're truly listening um, by giving the child our full attention, closing all the other brain tabs and being absolutely in this conversation right here right now if they're comfortable with it we might make eye contact with them and we might use our words to reflect back what we believe we've heard it's going to validate their feelings and encourage them to share a little bit more openly um, and we can encourage peer support as well in terms of communication. So teaching students how to support each other through active listening and through general kindness, compassion, empathy. Peer support is going to be really, really powerful and it's going to create this like network effect of understanding, empathy and compassion within your classroom. And what a great place that would be to be a part of. By focusing on this kind of positive classroom environment and utilising thoughtful communication strategies, we can build here a bit of a foundation for support that allows every child to thrive. This is about so much more than simple academic success, though that does tend to follow. It's about fostering this community, this culture, this environment within your classroom where every child feels understood, every child feels valued and every child feels capable of overcoming the challenges of day to day. Take a moment just to reflect on the environment that you're creating in your classroom or your home. And remember that if you're thinking here about there are some bits that might be suboptimal, um, that actually profound change can come from small acts of kindness, small acts of empathy, small acts of understanding. Before we conclude today's episode, let's touch upon an essential element in creating a calming environment for children who might become more easily overwhelmed than their peers, and that is the power of routine and predictability. Absolute stalwarts in my life and that of my autistic children. Establishing a consistent routine isn't just about structure, it's about creating a safe and predictable world where children and adults like me can thrive. Routine and predictability are going to significantly minimise the anxiety for many children, providing them with a sense of security and a sense of control. Knowing exactly what to expect from their day-to-day -day activities is going to reduce the fear of the unknown, which is a common trigger for feelings of overwhelm for our children. Here's a few strategies that you can use to implement consistent routines. Number one is daily schedules. So displaying a visual daily schedule in the classroom or indeed at home can help children to understand what's coming next. And that's going to reduce their anxiety around transitions, which can be an especially challenging time in the day. Next is consistent rules. Maintaining consistent rules and consistent expectations is absolutely crucial. Consistency in behaviour management is going to help children to understand what the boundaries are and what happens if they step beyond them. It's going to make the environment feel safer, more predictable, less hostile, less scary. 
Number three is preparation for changes. So when changes in routine are necessary, and sometimes they are, we're gonna prepare the child insofar as we can in advance. We can use stories, we can use visual aids, or just simply discussion to explain the change and what they can expect to happen instead of the norm. This is always a bit of a challenging one because predictability, consistency, routine are the things that make things feel safe and wonderful and absolutely much more easy to manage. But then when something does change, it's particularly challenging. And actually we need a little bit of practice of that sometimes because if it never happens, then on the day that it does, everything kind of falls apart. So it's okay for there to be a little bit of change sometimes. It's about how we prepare and support and scaffold the child in order to manage that. My personal experience is that when things get tougher for me, I lean harder and harder and harder into predictability consistency routine that makes it possible for me to manage day to day but then the tiniest thing changes and I'm absolutely unable to cope so this is about us trying to find a balance there that works for us works for the child prevents that overwhelm without de-skilling them because the less that we try to do slightly different things the less flexible that we become um, and the more easily we get derailed with really minor changes it's a tricky one. So incorporating these strategies um, is going to make a really significant difference in the lives of our children who find comfort in the predictability of their environments. So we're going to wrap our support in the structure of routine, which is going to offer them like a kind of guiding hand through the complexities of their day. Okay, so as we draw the episode to a close, remember, the goal here is not to eliminate challenges, but rather to equip our children with the tools that they need to navigate those challenges. Small changes in our approach can make a big difference in our children's lives, and it's going to foster an environment where every child feels understood, supported, and empowered to thrive. I encourage you please just to reflect on the strategies that we've discussed today. Which can you implement in your classroom or at home? How can you adjust your environment or your routine to better support the children in your care? What little changes might make a big difference here? This journey towards understanding and support is ongoing and every tiny step that you take is gonna make a much more meaningful impact than you might imagine. If today's episode resonated with you, please share it with others who you think might benefit. Your support helps us to reach more people who are dedicated to making a difference in the lives of children and young people. You can subscribe for future insights and consider joining my community over on Patreon for early access to resources and the opportunity to shape future discussions, as well as an opportunity just to show me that you care about the work that I do. I love my Patreons. They're this very special community of people who are are there just because they want to be, just to show they care, just to say we believe in what you're doing and yeah, I value every one of you, so thank you. If you really like me, um, you could chat to my agent Ellie, she is very lovely, one of life's good people, about having me speak at your event or deliver a webinar for you. Thank you so much for listening and for everything that you are doing for the children and young people in your care. It matters and you matter too. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knightsmith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over and out. Mm-hmm.